Thank you so much, Pastor Rich. Um, what a moment to be together. Today we continue our series, The Coming King. So far, emphasizing seeing the King, recognizing the King, and today, worshiping the King. Today I read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 15 in the New uh, Living Translation. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Holy Spirit, I thank you. Please open our eyes, our ears, give our hearts understanding so that we may worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew is concerned that his readers, first century Jews, understand that the much expected ruler, the Messiah, worthy of worship, is in fact Jesus of Nazareth. When he writes to his readers, He's writing to those who have the expectation that the Messiah is coming. He is wanting to persuade them of the truth that the Messiah, the promised anointed one, is himself Jesus the Christ. And so it's really important that we look at his focus so that we ourselves come to the place of worshiping Jesus as king. The word worship, in one of its meaning, has the sense of a kiss. This is the act of covering one's mouth with your hand and then extending it to one of higher rank or deity. Later, the same word came to be understood as an intentional attitude and reference. So I think it's important for us to understand that when we speak about worship, there's both the act of worship and there's also the attitude of worship. And for purposes of today, we want to understand that we are those who are called by God to engage in worship, both the act and the attitude, and the attitude of complete dependence on Jesus and submission to Jesus. Amen? As one theologian notes, all of the details surrounding the birth of Jesus are in complete harmony with the scriptures about the Messiah, a ruler born king. The same Jesus establishes uh, the kingdom of God, and he is, in fact, the much expected ruler. But in the minds of the Jews of the first century, many are not persuaded that 
the Messiah and Jesus are one and the same. You see, when it came to the Messiah, there are certain things that are important in the mind of the Jew. Number one, geology matters. Number two, geography matters. And number three, establishing the kingdom matters. Anyone professing to be the Messiah would meet these criteria and more. But these three will suffice for today. Genealogy matters. They had to be born king, not just appointed king. Number two, geography matters. The birthplace had to be Bethlehem. And number three, establishing the kingdom matters. It meant that in the mind of the Jew, the Messiah would actually establish the kingdom of God. This would be reestablishing the kingdom, much as it was during the days of David when he was king, and overthrowing Roman oppression. And so there were many who had questions as to whether or not Jesus is or is not the much-expected ruler, the Messiah. Because if he is the Messiah, then he's worthy of worship. If he is not the Messiah, then we still are looking for him to come. And Matthew says, there's no need to keep looking. Jesus himself is the Messiah. And this is why he begins this passage. We didn't read chapter 1, but I'd like you to go back and look at it. Because genealogy matters. We won't unpack it here because we're going to focus on chapter 2. But genealogy matters. In chapter 1, Matthew makes clear that Jesus is in relationship to David and he is in relationship to Abraham. The Jewish people understood that the Messiah would be the son of Abraham and also would be the son of David. That his lineage had to be traced back the geology of Christ had to be able to go back directly to David and then from David directly back to Abraham. If you could not make that link, then he did not have legitimacy to the throne of David. And he lists it for us in Matthew chapter 1. I won't read it, but you can. It's beautiful to see that Matthew painstakingly says, I want you to see how the genealogy flows from Abraham to David and from David to Jesus, verifying that Jesus is in fact born king of the Jews. But he's not just king in terms of his humanity. He's also king in terms of his deity because he's at the same time, while being the son of man, he's also the son of God. Amen? Geography matters. This is really important because he quotes what they had said in the Old Testament. And I want to reread that because it was... The Herod who called together the religious leaders and they responded, beginning in verse 5, in Bethlehem in Judea. When he asked the leading priests and teachers of the day, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Without hesitation, they said, in Bethlehem. This was not something that was unknown. They didn't have to use Google Maps and try to establish location. They knew from the scriptures that Jesus himself was going to, or that the Messiah, whether they knew he was Jesus or not, but they were certain that the Messiah, born king, would be born in Bethlehem. And so he painstakingly shows that Jesus is born there and has to be born in Bethlehem. He says, in Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. This is the Old Testament uh, 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 prophetic uh, inclination about or declaration that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus, on record, was born in Bethlehem. He starts meeting all the the measures that prove he is the Messiah. But lest we find ourselves like those in his day trying to measure Christ, he is the ruler who's come from Judah who measures all of us. And it's not we who measure him. And he's the one who's worthy of worship. So let's look at some of the things here. What about establishing the kingdom of God, establishing the kingdom of Israel. There was this expectation that he would put everything right. He would do away with Rome. He would 
he would put Israel back in charge. And I want you to understand something, that this would have been a legitimate expectation that they had based on their understanding of the Old Testament. David, who was king of Israel, defeated his enemies. <laughs> he defeated Goliath even before he became king. And once he became king, he, he defeated many of the enemies of God. And there was a coronation where he was enthroned as king. So they looked at the Messiah as the one who should defeat the enemy of that day and also be uh, enthroned. The problem they didn't understand is that Jesus didn't come to defeat Rome. He came to defeat the greatest enemy of all enemies, the devil himself. And when that enemy is defeated, then all other enemies can be defeated. And by the way, those enemies are not just ethnicities. They are not that in, in fact at all. Those enemies are the enemies of our soul. Hatred, lying, injustice, which cause all the problems that happen among humanity. I hope you can hear that. And there's something else to be understood that Jesus said that I, when he was trying to help people understand the kingdom of God, he pictured it for them. He used an illustration from Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. The beauty of the kingdom of God Jesus kept talking about the kingdom is like this, the kingdom is like this. He said it's like a woman who took yeast and she put it in three measures of flour and kneaded it. The kingdom begins to permeate all of life. It permeates beginning our own hearts and minds, and then it permeates our families, then it permeates our communities, it permeates the cities, it permeates the nations. The kingdom of God currently is permeating its way throughout the world, and God is doing it through those who worship him as king, not just an act but also an attitude. And so this is the ongoing process. Well, when will we see uh, the, the kingdom of God in its full array, in its full exercise of authority over all things? Jesus currently has all authority in heaven and earth. But today is a day of favor where God invites us willingly to come and receive salvation and to submit to him and enter into his kingdom. But he also gives us the free will to reject. And so we're living in a world where some are choosing to follow and some are choosing to reject. And only at the end of the time, when he comes back, will there be a complete expression and manifold demonstration of the kingdom of God? And if you're expecting for this world just to get better, let me give you some tips. I pity you if your hope is only in this world. God is not intending to make this world better. He's actually going to make a better world for us. But we live by faith, winning as many people as we can while we're in this world, which is living in hostility toward a king that they refuse to worship. So these are some of the things that need to be understood. Matthew is very clear. The Messiah is born in Bethlehem. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. The Messiah is from the line of David and the line of Abraham. Jesus is from the line of David and Abraham. What he's saying is, to worship the Messiah is to worship Jesus. Why? Because the Messiah and Jesus are one and the same. He's the king worthy of praise. That's something worth chatting about. I hope you'll chat right there if you love Jesus and if you worship him as king. Only the Messiah is worthy of the act and the attitude of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship as king. He is the ruler who's come from Judah, who's the ruler of the world. I want to continue to work with our definition here. When we talk about worship, it's not just the act, but it's the attitude. It is the attitude of complete dependence and submission to Jesus. The act of worship is to flow from the attitude of worship. God will not settle for the act without the attitude. Let me say that again. God will not settle for the act of attitude, the act of worship without the attitude of worship. They work to, to, uh, in tow together. The act should flow from the attitude. So let's look at some who have had an opportunity to respond and so that we might learn. When Herod heard from the Magi that Jesus was born king, or where is he was born king, he was greatly disturbed. He was not delighted. Why? Because he was a political appointee of Rome. He himself was not born king. He was placed as king. And hearing news of one who was born king threatened him. 
does, does, do you, are you disturbed or are you delighted by the thought of worshiping Jesus? Particularly when you think of worship as not just an act, not just words sung, not just hands lifted, but the submission of your life in obedience to him. When you think of worship as obedience, as submission, are you delighted or are you disturbed when Jesus enters into your sphere? Herod was greatly disturbed. And so it's a question of submission or assassination. And he says to the Magi, tell me, when you find him, so I can come and worship him too. He's talking about he wants to worship Jesus. Well, maybe some act is in his mind, but certainly there's no attitude in his heart with respect to proper worship, only assassination. Why? Because he's interested in self-preservation. And it's not just Herod. The people of the day, they were also greatly disturbed about this same information. I want to look at others who too had this opportunity to encounter Jesus as king and how they responded. Pilate, in John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37, says, Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, Is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What a picture. Pilate is standing before Jesus. And Jesus is saying, when he asked, are you a king? He said, are you asking of your own initiative or did others tell you about me? In other words, is my father inclining your heart to worship me as king, to come to the point of complete dependence and reliance and submission to me and worship me as king? And he's offended by that thought. He says, am I a Jew? <laughs> and Jesus is like, listen, I, I'm not just king of the Jews I'm king of all creation because I made man in my own image and likeness. And Pilate is given an opportunity to worship Jesus as king. But instead of submission, he chooses crucifixion. You see, we all come face to face with Jesus. The only question is, will you worship him as king? Both in act and attitude, with reverence and submission. Or will you reject him like Herod? Reject him like Pilate? I love this picture of Jesus standing there with Pilate, and it looks like Jesus is on trial. But the truth of the matter is, it's Pilate who's on trial before Jesus. Will you bow and will you worship him? And he was greatly disturbed. He didn't know what to do. He was looking for a way out of that situation. But there are others. How about Judas? In Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 50, Judas was one of the followers one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. And in this verse it says, And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priest and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi. He exclaimed and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you've come for. I'm gripped. No one wants to think of themselves as betraying Jesus or a traitor of Jesus or, 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 or Judas. No one wants to regard themselves as this way, but I want you to see the act we, we, we said earlier how worship at one point was defined as a kiss. In, in ancient times when someone was coming before someone who was of a higher rank or deity, they would place their hand over their mouth and then wave toward them that kiss as if to say, I'm honoring you. It's an act of worship. Later on, the kiss might take as a kiss on the cheek, and that was a form of honor. And here comes Judas, a traitor, with an act 
an outward act, an outward show of admiration, of loyalty, of, of, of reliance on and commitment to. And he says, greetings, Rabbi, as he gives him a kiss on the cheek. But I want you to know, Jesus knows the difference between the acts of worship and the attitude of worship, and he knows it just as well in you and me as he does in someone like Judas. Judas comes and kisses him on the cheek, and Jesus looks him in the eyes and says, friend, do what you've come to do. I know this act of yours is betraying your own heart, which is betraying me. This is no attitude of worship. It's an outward act. But your heart is far from me. And Jesus over and over, even in the Old Testament, warns us, with your lips you praise me. Even on Sunday, even on Saturday, on Monday, riding in your car, you can be singing songs and get your praise on, but your heart be far from him because the attitude of worship is much greater than just the act of worship and the act should flow from the attitude and the attitude is not just your feels I'm feeling good to this song and that's my jam and I love worshiping that's all good but the attitude of worship is one of reverence are you not just bowing but is your heart bowed have you said yes I submit my money is yours my job is yours my spouse is yours my kids are yours everything I got from you is yours and I bow and offer back to you only that which I got from you That is the attitude of worship. Never define worship as something that happens on just a Sunday morning during a three-song set. Because you can go through that act and your attitude be nowhere in the ballpark. The Magi. Their story is a little different than those I've read before. They're not like Herod. They're not like Pilate. They're not like the people of the day. They're not like Judas. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, it says, When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. (laughs) They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These brothers, these brilliant men, these scientists, these royal men who appeared at the palace of Herod expecting the one born king to be at that palace. (laughs) Herod was clueless. What? What? Oh, he's not here at the palace? And at that point, he was no longer the baby in the manger. He's a toddler walking around. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Let's unpack this. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. The star was a sign to lead them to the king for the purpose of worship. In our generation, much like that generation, we love signs and wonders. We love it when God heals us supernaturally. We love it when God does a miracle and somehow you didn't have the resources to take care of your responsibilities, but God miraculously provides. We love the signs and the wonders that God does in our life. And we thank, thank you. But I want you to see something. When they saw the star and they were filled with joy, they didn't stop at that point. Some of us, when we get a sign from God, we settle with the sign rather than the Savior. We settle with the wonder rather than worship the King. We're, we just want the sign more than we want the one the sign points to. But they didn't do that. Some of us will stop right at seeing a sign. We get filled with joy and then we're on our way. Check your heart. When God does something wonderful in your life, do you just take it and go on your way? And maybe there's some dutiful act of worship, but it doesn't result in an attitude of worship. It says they they entered the house. It wasn't enough for them just to have a sign. May it never be enough for you to just have a sign. Woo! (laughs) Did you see what the Holy Spirit did? That man, that's good. What a sign. Isn't that great? Oh, no, I'm not really down with obeying God on that. I just wanted the sign. I just wanted the wonder. I just wanted the miracle. I wanted something from him. I didn't really want him. Examine our hearts, Lord, and help us know when we want something from you versus we really want you. They entered the house. They saw the child with his mother. 
Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Not them, him. They saw Mary and Jesus, but they worshiped him because he's the king. They worshiped him. They bowed down and worshiped him. Some enter the house and they see Jesus, and that's all they do. Do you show up on Sunday? Do you enter what we call the house of the Lord? And we know there's not just a physical house, there's not just a virtual house, there's a spiritual house, which we are. But do you assemble with God's people and enter in, but your motivation in coming is not to worship the king, it's to, ooh, child, I hope he's going to be there, or maybe she's going to be there. Why are you really showing up? What got you to come in here? Was it to really see the king, or was it to see something else? They saw him. But they didn't stop. So some of you see a sign, some of you fill with joy, some of you enter the house, but after you enter, you see him and you're like, I'm good, I just wanted to see. I'm not, I'm not inclined to do more than just see. I just want to watch. I just want to, I just want to observe. I don't want to participate. I don't want to engage. I'm not committed. Because if I commit, the king might ask me to do something in his house. And I don't want to do that. As soon as service is over, I'm out the door. Because I came here to be served, not to serve him. Chat, amen, or oh my. No, like Pastor Rich said, I'm going to wait. Chat, amen, or oh my. They saw him after traveling as far as they did. And they bowed down. That's the act of worship. But I want you to know something. It didn't just say they bowed down. Because we could think that the bowing down itself is worship. But the scripture is clear. They bowed down and worshiped. Which means it's possible to bow down without worshiping. It's possible to raise your hands without worshiping. It's possible to sing without worshiping. It's possible to dance and run without worshiping. It's possible to do a whole lot of stuff that we call worship that Jesus goes, that ain't worship because your attitude is not like mine. You're going through the act. You're going through the motions. You want to know what worship looks like? When God asks you to do something that you don't want to do and you go, yes, sir, that's worship. <laughs> Let me say that again. Do you know what worship looks like? It doesn't look like. That's the act. But the attitude is, he just asked me to do something that I don't necessarily want to do, but because he's king, I obey. They bowed down and they worshiped him. Let's worship Jesus as king. They bowed down and they worshiped him. Let us be those who don't stop at seeing a sign, who don't stop at being filled with joy and go, I feel better now. I'm just going to go on my way. But we actually enter into the house and we bow down for the purpose of engaging our king in worship. Type worship in the text. Anybody want to worship our king? And you don't just have to do it this time of year. You can do it 365. Some worship and then he, they give gifts. What valuable gifts do you offer Jesus as an expression of worship? What gifts has God given to you that you've come now and you realize just as the wise men came from such a great distance, how long did it take you to get to Christ? How many years did he have to pursue you before you found out you weren't where you were supposed to be? I know when I was born, I wasn't worshiping Jesus. It took quite a, it took a couple of decades before I came to the plate of worshiping him. And I realized I've been carrying these gifts and I've been using them for myself. I've been using my gifts to benefit Donnell. I've been using my gifts to advance my agenda, create my, my job resume, but when do you come and say these gifts that I have that are so valuable the greatest privilege I have is not to spend them on myself but to lay them at your feet have you laid the gifts that God has given you at his feet in worship (sighs) whose example should we follow when it comes to submission what about us 
be honest if you need to repent that instead of submission, if any of these apply to you, hesitation, deliberation, explanation, moderation, celebration. That instead of submission, sometimes there's a little bit of hesitation. <laughs> um, let me think about that. Deliberation, you know, because I'm trying to do this with my life. I'm not sure. Worshiping could be a little. Let me, let me give an explanation. Let me tell you. Until you come to the point of submission and worshiping him as king, you'll never fully be or do why you were put here. It starts with at his feet. Philippians 2, chapter, <clears throat> uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? How many are encouraged about belonging to him? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Verse 3, don't be selfish, y'all. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests like Herod did, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Chat, chat that, same attitude. Same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And this should be done as an attitude of worship. Jesus defeated the greatest enemy, thereby making it possible. Freedom for all other enemies. Freedom from hatred, injustice, arrogance, disease, fear. And the Father has given him the highest honor and a name above all names. We get to bow and worship him. And our lives are him, are his. When it comes to the attitude of complete dependence and submission to Jesus as king, are you disturbed or are you delighted? Father, I pray. There's something about your presence as king that can be quite disturbing. Because you are king and you are worthy of worship. Not just the act of worship, but the attitude, complete reliance and dependence on and submission to. Ongoing submission. And so I want to raise my hand and invite anybody watching to raise your hand if this applies to you and pray. God in heaven, who humbled himself greater than any and all others. Not clinging to equality with God as a thing to be held on to, but emptying himself, making himself nothing. Being born as a baby, born king. I want to have that same mindset in me. Too often I've been troubled or disturbed when it comes to worship. Uh, not so much the act, but the attitude, yes. When I want my will over your will, when I want my way over your way, when I have justified living in sin based on social norms and what's acceptable, but your heart and mind has not changed about it. Lord Jesus, with my heart, I yield, I surrender. With my tongue, I confess Jesus, Lord. I repent of pretending to be in charge when there's only one king. And Matthew made it very clear. You are the Messiah, the Savior. 
one king. If you agree with that, put that in the chat. Some of you, it may be new for you in terms of this is the beginning of a relationship where you worship Jesus as king. We've been talking about seeing, recognizing, and now worshiping. And some of you, you, you have bowed down but haven't followed through with the worship. Repent. Let God change your heart so that you can have a new mindset, a new attitude. So that this season and going into the new year, you're not just bowing down, but you're really worshiping. And if you agree with that, say amen. Put that in the chat. I love you.